the, the situation is such that people die every day for lack of an organ. At the same time, a huge number of organs go to waste uh, when people die in an automobile accident or through some other means and they, uh, their organs are buried with them when those same organs could save lives. So roughly 60,000 people die in the last decade uh, on the waiting list for an organ and about 60,000 people have not donated their organs when they could have been donated. So just a little nudge would uh, uh, do enormous amounts of good in terms of saving lives and making sick people's lives better. There are proposals to abandon our present system, uh, which relies on the consent of the donor or the donor's family and go to some other strategy the most radical of which would simply be to declare uh, a deceased body the property of the state, and the state could take organs whenever they wanted. I don't think we'll go that route, but if we did, you can imagine thousands of people uh, in the United States alone, thousands of people's lives would be saved. From the point of view of the ethics involved, there are two ways we could get your organs. We could get your organs if you donate them, where the presumption is they belong to you and we can't take them and without proper permission. The alternative is what used to be called routine salvaging, where we just take the organs uh, regardless of whether you're willing to donate or not. Uh, many countries in Europe and Asia have gone to a routine salvaging scheme where organs can simply be taken usually with what's called an opt-out, meaning if you've actually written your objection, then the organs won't be taken. That's different from presuming consent. In presuming consent, the argument is we have some reason to believe you would consent if asked, and therefore will proceed as if you had consented. We know for a fact uh, a large minority of people in virtually all cultures would object if they were asked to donate their organs. So I'm categorically opposed to presuming consent. I think presuming consent is an ethical trick. Uh, if we know in advance that a large minority of people would not consent, to claim we're taking the organs on the presumption of consent is just contrary to the facts. If we're going to go that route of taking organs without consent, I think we ought to call it what it is. We ought to call it routine salvaging. Uh, one transplant surgeon has even called it conscription of organs. The way we conscript bodies into the military service, we could conscript organs from people after their death. But that wouldn't be presuming consent anymore. That would simply be recognizing uh, that the state has a right to those organs. Right now, in the case of kidneys, we do several thousand living kidney donor transplants. This is almost always a family member or a close friend uh, who is asked to, to undergo the surgery for the removal of the kidney and the transplant to another family member. Um, we used to worry a great deal about uh, kind of psychologically coercing the family member. Um, I think that's less of a problem today. We're pretty careful uh, to make sure that the one who is a living kidney donor is willing to make the donation. So I'm, I'm not too worried about uh, concern about excess pressure on, on family donors. Uh, sometimes when uh, the one asked to donate is a friend, then there's the possibility that there could be some incentive, some under-the-table payment that might be made. And that uh, continues to be an ethical concern, particularly at the international level, uh, where poor people in third world countries 
seem to be pressured into volunteering uh, to donate a kidney to uh, a wealthy person from a first world country uh, who can easily pay a large sum of money. Most of that money doesn't go to the recipient, uh, to, to, the, to the donor of the, of the kidney anyway. It goes to middlemen and surgeons and those who arrange the transplant. But if we're talking about living donors within a family or a close friendship network, uh, increasingly that is becoming routine. It's not a terribly dangerous surgery. It's extremely rare that something will go wrong. So uh, several thousand kidneys in the U.S. are procured from living donors uh, every year. There's some interesting and subtle problems. Some of the data show, for instance, that women are more likely to be donors than men, uh, suggesting a kind of dependency role or that some women might be under pressure from others in the family. Part of that may have, have to do with employment arrangements. A, a man would have to take, say, a month off of a job uh, where a stay-at-home uh, housewife, uh, they might think, uh, jeopardizes employment less if the, if the female in the family is the donor. So there are subtle issues of that sort that, by and large, uh, living donors becoming uh, an important source of kidneys, and they work better. Uh, if you have somebody in your family who needs a kidney transplant, if they wait for an organ from what we call the cadaveric donor pool, from, from deceased bodies, first of all, they have to wait a long time, wait five years or so for an organ, and people die every day on the waiting list. So if we can get a living donor, we get a better kidney, a more viable kidney, uh, and this, it shows up in the survival rate statistics. When the uh, National Organ Transplantation Act was passed in 1984, there's a provision in the law that says that uh, no valuable consideration can be given for the donating of an organ. That applies either to donation after death or to uh, becoming a living donor. Uh, that means that uh, various strategies that have been put forward to encourage people to donate, to get over that hump of uh, just not wanting to think about the problem, uh, th those strategies run into ethical and legal complications because of the law saying there can be no valuable consideration. The most straightforward and obvious idea would be uh, to pay people money to provide their organs. They're not donors anymore. You can't call somebody who's paid for an organ an organ donor. They're an organ vendor or an organ seller or something like that. Um, that law was passed now 25 years ago, and some of us have propose that we revisit that issue and that we at least consider experiments with incentives either to encourage people to sign up to be organ donors on the driver's license, a token incentive, like a $5 discount on your driver's license renewal if you sign up to be an organ donor, a, a token incentive to just get you to think about the problem I believe would be uh, a legitimate idea to experiment with. Uh, or you might pay the family of somebody who has died if the family uh, provides the organ. Uh, there have been proposals of that sort. Those are all illegal in the United States, so we would need to change the law. Uh, in 1984, I actually testified in Congress while that law was being adopted. And I said at the time that I thought that organ donations should stay detached from money matters, that it's um, much better if we can do this on an altruistic basis without financial incentives. But I also said 
that it's a real tragedy if people are dying for lack of an organ while we're burying usable organs, especially if we're burying usable organs from people who would really not object to they just haven't gotten around to making the donation. So I said, if in 20 years or so, we don't have enough organs, we ought to revisit this question. And I think that time has come. So I have now publicly endorsed experiments with uh, various incentives to see what it would do to the organ donation rate. Uh, right now, we know we get 50 to 70 percent of available organs. If we could get that up to 75, 80 percent uh, with uh, some sort of incentive, uh, a token payment to the family of, say, uh, $3,000 if uh, organs are transplanted from a deceased family member. Um, it sort of taints the altruism of organ donation. On the other hand, real human lives are at stake here, and I would be willing to uh, compromise the altruism uh, at the margins if we could really uh, save some lives. Uh, the original objection to financial incentives was that it would put undue pressure on the very poor. Um, my view at the time was that that was a serious concern, and therefore, for the time being, we ought to make money payments illegal. But I said, what's really the tragedy in a wealthy country like the United States is that there are some people who are so poor and so desperate that they would literally be willing to sell a kidney in order, say, for instance, to feed their children. So I said, the job for a wealthy country is to make sure that there's nobody that desperately poor. And if we had an, a plan for taking care of the most destitute, the most poverty-stricken, then we could open up the question of financial incentives without worrying about undue coercive pressures. Um, it's obvious that we haven't done a very good job about that. We still have people going hungry every day, and we have people who feel so desperate that they would be willing to sell their organs. We've got to do one thing or the other. We either have to have a safety net for the very poor, so no one is desperately in need of food and shelter. Or we ought to admit that we're not such good citizens as we thought we were and open up some sort of incentive scheme. I've, I've gone on record now as saying it's time for us to admit it if we're not willing to take care of the very poor. And once we admit that, uh, then perhaps experimenting with some incentive schemes. I don't think it's the best way to go. It would be best if everybody donated their, if everybody donated their organ who didn't have a principled objection to donation, we'd get probably 50% more organs than we presently get. And that would go a long way toward uh, meeting the shortage. It probably wouldn't completely cover the shortfall, but it would help a lot. If we can't go that route, then I, I favor various strategies, one of which would be financial incentives uh, that at least stimulate you to think about this problem when you'd rather be thinking about something else. I've also endorsed what I call required response. Right now, almost all states have a registry where you can register your willingness to donate your organs at your death. What I would propose is a slight variation where everyone is required to answer the donation question. Uh, say yes, you can say no, or perhaps you could say, leave it up to my family. Uh, that way, uh, if it were done, for instance, through the Department of Motor Vehicles, 
it would be a question you have to answer on the application form. If we're going to go that route, instead of doing it through the Department of Motor Vehicles, sometimes the clerks at the department aren't terribly committed to education about organ donation, uh, I would prefer the question be on our income tax returns. That way there'd be one central database in the nation that registers everyone who's an organ donor. You'd get a chance to rethink the question every year when you file your taxes. The IRS, one thing they're pretty good at is computerized databases. So we would have one central computerized database that probably download the answers to that question, send it to Richmond, Virginia, where the United Network for Organ Sharing is, and then we'd have a national database updated every year. Virtually every adult uh, would be on record as whether they're a donor or not. Religious commitments can be both a help and a hindrance to organ donation. Um, there is no major religion in the world that clearly opposes organ donation and organ transplantation. In fact, many religions at least recognize the nobility of being committed to your fellow human beings to the point that you would go a little bit out of your way, sign up to be an organ donor in order to save several people's lives. It's considered an altruistic charitable act and, and all the major religions look favorably upon that behavior. Some, in fact, go even further. Orthodox Judaism, for instance, gives very high priority to the duty to save another human life. So even though Orthodox Judaism generally has limits on the abuse of a dead body, have burial requirements and the like, in the case where procuring an organ can save another identifiable life, many uh, rabbinical scholars would insist that it's your duty to make the organs available. Uh, so uh, Judaism is particularly strongly committed uh, to organ procurement. There are some informal perhaps less well-educated groups who uh, think that somehow their religion might pose some limits. Uh, Native Americans recognize some uh, uh, concerns about uh, the desecration of the body, particularly they have reservations about pronouncing death by brain criteria. So do certain Asian groups, Japanese often uh, show resistance. Both Buddhism and traditional indigenous Japanese uh, religion, uh, we would refer to as Shintoism, uh, both of them uh, are s potentially a bit skeptical about the good that can be done, particularly they're skeptical about death by brain criteria. But no major religion really has an objection. The, there's an interesting uh, problem in fundamentalist Christianity among those who believe in the bodily resurrection. There, if you think about it for a moment, the implications for the bodily resurrection are quite traumatic if your organs have been removed. None of us would like to be resurrected with a heart and liver missing. Uh, it's kind of important to do your theological homework, however. Uh, this has been a problem in fundamentalist Christianity since the Middle Ages. After all, think of the dilemma for someone who believes in the bodily resurrection if a loved one is burned up in a house fire. The thought of being resurrected in that existing body consumed by fire is a pretty awful thought. The medieval theologians had an answer to this dilemma. If you read any of the classical theological discussions for those who are concerned about bodily resurrection, uh, the doctrine is you will be resurrected with a new and perfect body. In fact, Hank Williams has a wonderful uh, country song, religious song, I'll have a new body, I'll have a new life. 
We like to play Hank Williams for our, any church group where there's concern about the effect on the resurrection uh, if you've uh, donated the organs. The doctrine is when you're resurrected, you'll be resurrected to look like you, but with all the bad stuff fixed. Uh, so if you had cancer, the cancer won't be there. Uh, and if organs have been procured or consumed by fire, uh, you'll get a new version of the body. So even in fundamentalist Christianity, uh, there's no real reason to have any reservation about organ transplant. This is a serious problem in the black church. Black church has some reser uh, reservations about organ transplant some for these theological reasons, where a good theologian should be able to sort things out. Uh, the more serious concern in the black community is uh, their local hospital may not have treated the surrounding community uh, fairly in the past. So some people are worried uh, that if they sign up to be organ donors, and then are taken to a hospital after an accident, uh, the surgeons will just be interested in the organs, not in curing the patient. There's a strict, strict rule in the transplant community that says that the organ procurement team has to be separated from the emergency room of physicians whose sole job it is to try to pull the patient through. Once they've decided that the patient can't be pulled through, there may even be a decision made to withdraw life support, then death is pronounced, then the transplant team can come onto the scene and we can take up the question of whether uh, uh, organs can be procured. So uh, there are religious as well as social and economic uh, concerns, uh, but the transplant community is very familiar with that and they've worked very hard uh, the ethical conflict of interest.